Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us. This is the Inclusionary Zoning Orientation presented by Housing Counseling Services. The webinar will last approximately two hours, and uh, we do ask that you um, stay actively engaged the entire time. Uh, first of all, everybody will be in listen-only mode. And um, we, uh, we have reports from Zoom that let us know you've logged in, so there's no need to check in with us, all right? Um, now, as I said, we'd like you to stay engaged the entire time. Actually, the D.C. Department of Housing and Community Development, they're the ones who administer the inclusionary zoning program, and they do ask that we verify your participation today. We'll start by doing so through pop-up polls, and we have a test poll that we're going to put up now. Please go ahead and um, respond to the test poll. Make sure that you can use that. Um, if you're not able to see our poll right this moment, then double check and make sure it's not hidden behind some other screens that you might have open. Also, you wanna check and see if you have a pop-up blocker engaged. Um, now we know that folks are participating by telephone and listening in and we do um, support that as well. And for those of you who are not able to see the poll, we ask that you write down your responses to our poll questions. And then we're going to give you an email address later on. And we're gonna ask you to email those responses to us, okay? So don't put them in the chat box or the Q&A box, but the responses to the polls should be sent to us all together in one email. And we'll give you that email address later on, but that's only for people who are not able to see the poll questions right now, all right? Okay, looks like uh, we've got excellent participation so far, well over 200 people today, and um, that's great. So we'll go ahead and close out the poll right now. Okay, um, we have some other things that we're going to do as well to verify your participation. One is um, Zoom does let us know if you've wandered away from our screen, our presentation here. And so please keep our screen uppermost on your screen device. Um, unfortunately, you're not going to be able to miss more than 15 minutes of the presentation. So please keep our screen uppermost on your screen device. Um, now, I'm not going to be responding to questions in real time, unfortunately. Um, we do have staff available, though, to help with questions, and they will be responding in the Q&A box. So please put your questions in the Q&A box. I'm going to um, continue to move forward through the presentation so that we can get it done in the time that we've allotted, um, the two hours that we've allotted. Um, now, the presentation itself, the slides, will be available for you to download later on. We ask that you wait until we're all done because we don't want you to miss that 15 minutes. Uh, but later on when we're done, you can go to our website and download the slides you would have to go back to our webinar registration page. And if you scroll all the way down to the bottom of that page, you would see descriptions for all of our different webinars. Um, embedded in the description for the inclusionary zoning webinar is a link that will let you download today's slides. But again, please wait until we're all done to do that. And we'll remind you about that later on, okay? Um, and I'm not going to be responding to the raised hand function. Um, again, we're going to keep moving forward so we can get this thing done. Um, there will be a final quiz, just so you know. Um, there's six questions on that quiz. Um, you have to get at least four of those six questions correct. So we do ask that you pay attention so that you can get full credit for participating today and make sure that you get at least four of those six questions correct. Um, let's see, and if you're not able to participate through the poll function on that final quiz, we will provide you with an alternative quiz, um, and we'll tell you how to get access to that later on, okay? Um, now, for all of you who do complete all of the requirements, you will be provided with a certificate of completion, and um, that certificate will be emailed to you okay and it will be sent out in um no more than five business days okay so you should receive it um, before five business days so that's the certificate for the inclusionary zoning program all right all right so now one last thing um there's still you know of course you know some folks who have need for um, um the covid vaccine and you can get information about it by going to vaccine.gov. You may also go to coronavirus.dc.gov. 
And if you'd like to make arrangements to receive a vaccine shot, you may call 855-363-0333. Again, that's 855-363-0333. Now, um, before I jump right into our agenda, I do just want to talk briefly about our organization. Um, Housing Counseling Services is a nonprofit. We've been around for 50 years now, and we provide our services for free. And uh, we assist folks in Maryland, D.C., and Virginia. Uh, We primarily do that through um, a few ways. One, of course, is through group sessions like this, these webinars. We also have uh, members of our training team who go into the community and uh, present in person to community groups. Um, We also um, have um, our counselors who work one-on-one with folks on an individual basis, trying to get them prepared for whatever they're trying to do with respect to housing. Um, Also helping them fill out applications or get them prepared for that application process. Um, And that's really at the heart of our organization. Um, And then we have other folks who um, go out into the community as well. Um, We have a tenant services section and they um, go to different apartment buildings throughout the week, usually in the evenings, meeting with tenant groups, um, trying to resolve landlord tenant issues. And we also have folks who go to the courts. Um, Some uh, work to prevent evictions and then there's another group that works to prevent foreclosure. And, um, and then lastly, we have a whole bunch of other folks who are processing applications of one sort or another. And um, very busy and diligently trying to get people um, that are getting incomes certified and things like that. And we'll talk a little bit about that um, during this process. So um, very busy organization, very active. Most of our work is remote these days, um, just so you're aware. If you want to uh, interact with somebody in our office, please reach out to us by email or phone and we'll make arrangements to do that. So now, the Inclusionary Zoning Program, IZ, as you may have heard it called, um, it is a program that uh, we're going to go through thoroughly. Uh, First, we're going to start by talking about the basics of the program that are going to apply across the board. And then we're going to get into into some specifics for those of you who plan on renting. And we'll go into uh, requirements there. Um, Also, for those of you who plan on owning or purchasing an inclusionary zoning unit, uh, we'll get into those specifics. And then we'll get into the random selection process or the IZ lottery. And then we'll cover some next steps. All right. So now getting into the basics that apply to everybody across the board. Basically, it starts with the fact that the inclusionary zoning program has had housing available since around 2011. And um, the housing is set aside um, uh, as, quote unquote, affordable, and it's set aside forever. And so that, that, that uh, is done basically right at the construction phase. Okay, it's, it's given that designation, and it must keep that designation forever. And this is one way in which the city is trying to keep some affordable housing in the District of Columbia. Okay. Now, of course, we'll get into how they define affordable for this program. As we know, that can be a real squishy term when it comes to housing. Um, but that's kind of the gist of how this thing goes. And um, the fact that it has to be affordable forever is going to have some impacts as, as we go through this process. And I'll try to highlight those as we go. Um, but um, in general, what will happen is a builder will um, you know, get permission to build maybe 100 units. Then they would be required to set aside a percentage of those units as inclusionary zoning units. In general, that percentage is going to be somewhere between 7 and 12 percent. And so an easy way to think about it is just to round to uh, a number that's in the middle, 10. Okay, so roughly 10 percent. And so if they were building a 100 unit building, You could assume that roughly 10 units in that building are inclusionary zoning units, okay? Um, Now, with that said, you know, the inclusionary zoning law went into effect several years ago. It has changed a little bit over time. Um, And um, I'll try to highlight some of those changes um, as we go through the presentation. Now, the units are actually going to be available all over the District of Columbia. 
you know, all four quadrants, all eight wards. Um, oftentimes you'll find them where they're mixed use zones, where you'll find commercial and residential in, in close proximity, okay? Um, in general, uh, we've got a, a map here on the screen, and in general, you'll see that the, the these blue dots are spread out all over the city. These blue dots represent inclusionary zoning units. And you'll see that some are bigger, some are smaller. The bigger the dot, that means there are more units in that location. And this was a map, just so you know, that was uh, rendered in March of 2022. So it's, uh, it's a year old now. So there's a few more blue dots on there at this point in time um, and then just so you know the purple area that they have there that's the land area where inclusionary zoning units could conceivably be built all right and so they've got some open space there and over the years of the program um, that purple shaded area has grown a little bit um, that's just one of the changes that, that they've made trying to work more towards the downtown portion of the city to try to create more housing in that area all right so of course with the housing being set aside uh, for low to moderate income households there are going to be income requirements and we're going to get into the specifics of that in a few slides but just in general um there are you do need to meet income requirements and those requirements are going to be based on gross income okay or pre-tax income and we're talking about your income today not the income on um on any taxes that were prepared okay but your income today based on your pay stubs you know, or you know if you have self-employment your um the net proceeds from that self-employment all right but it's going to be that gross income for all members of the household combined together and um, so that's significant. Okay, make sure you're clear on that. And also an important factor is the household size. And we're talking about adults and children, and you can even include unborn children if you have medical verification, all right? Um, and then another issue that uh, are two things that are potential um, priority factors are whether uh, someone in the household currently works in DC um, or if someone in the household currently lives in D.C., okay? So those are some other priority factors. And um, that's it, okay? So sometimes we're asked about whether housing is set aside for seniors or disabled or what have you. Unfortunately, no, okay? This program was not set up or designed that way. And so it's strictly based on income, um, household size, whether someone lives in D.C., whether someone works in D.C., those are the only ranking factors, okay? Now, um, one thing you need to be aware of going into it is that full-time college and university students are not allowed to be the head of household in an IZ home, okay? Um, basically, uh, you have to be a dependent of an IZ qualifying household, and that's regardless of age. You know, we know that some folks go back to school years later to try to get advanced degrees or what have you. If your educational institution considers you a full-time student, then you're not allowed to be that head of household, okay? And if someone else has to be the head of household, that person needs to be in this webinar, and that person would need to register for the program, all right? Okay. Now, moving on, um, some things you need to be aware of with IZ housing are that that IZ unit must be your primary residence. You're not going to be allowed to rent out any portion of it, not allowed to rent out a couch, not allowed to do Airbnb or any of those programs, all right? Um, now, the only exception is for folks who um, maybe their employer has temporarily assigned them to work outside the District of Columbia, okay, or outside of our region. And so if that's the case, then they would be allowed to temporarily rent out their home, that unit. Um, but there's a catch here also. Um, you're not gonna be allowed to charge just any amount you want to for rent. You're gonna be told the maximum amount you can charge in rent, okay? Again, the housing must be, quote unquote, affordable forever, all right? Now, um, when purchasing an IZ unit, you do still have some restrictions, okay? 
Now, when it comes to resale, your resale price is also going to be uh, set to a certain maximum. Um, again, you know, it must be quote unquote affordable. Someone going through this program must be able to purchase your home. So you're not going to be able to have, you're not going to have that luxury of setting any price you want. And they're going to base that on a formula that's in the regulations. Okay. Now you can sell anytime you want to, you can buy today, sell tomorrow. They, they don't restrict you on that. They do restrict you on the price. All right. You need to be aware of that going into it. So with IZ housing as an owner, um, this is not the type of program you can use if your goal is to get rich in real estate. All right. Then the program's just not designed for that. It's meant to provide housing and, and try to keep it affordable in the, in the district of Columbia. Um, now everybody at some point in time will have to recertify something every year. Okay. Now it's different for renters versus buyers. Uh, so just to be clear for renters every year, you have to recertify your income and your household, um, and confirm that it is your primary residence. Okay, so you have to recertify all of that information every year if you are renting. If you purchase an IZ home, the only thing you have to recertify every year is the fact that you live in it as your primary residence. So there's that difference there. So for people who purchase, you only certify your income one time, and that's at the point of purchase. Renters have to certify their income every year, every 12 months right now something else that applies across the board whether you're renting or buying you're not going to be allowed to you know to take over that property if you currently have your name attached to any other real estate all right so if you currently have your name attached to any other real estate anywhere okay then you're not going to be allowed to sign a lease and you're not going to be allowed to actually purchase that iz unit okay so if you own something right now, or if your name is on something right now, you've got to get your name off of it before you move forward to actually sign a lease and purchase the IC property. So what IC is not, all right? First of all, it's, it's not a get rich quick program. Okay. Uh, just be, just be mindful of that. But also it's not a program where you're going to receive any financial um, assistance uh, in any way. You're not going to receive a voucher. You're not going to receive a subsidy. You kind of come up with a way to pay for it. Okay. Now, if you receive a voucher from some other program, that's all well and good. You can use that. Okay. Um, but this program will not provide you with one. The benefit it provides you with is a home that you can move into that is priced below market rate. Okay. So they, that's the benefit they give you. Um, and it's also not a program where you're going to pay a certain portion or percentage of your income. You know, there are programs out there that, um, are, uh, we're going to adjust the rent based on your income as your income goes up or down. Um, this program does not do that. It's going to be a fixed rent. You've got to find a way to pay it every 12 months. You're signing a 12 month lease for that certain amount. You've got to find a way to pay for it. If your income goes down you might have some difficult decisions to make. Okay. Um, so in terms of affordable, you know, we, we danced around this a little bit so far. Let's dig into it some, um, for IZ units, the maximum rent or purchase price is going to be set for three different income levels. And basically you have three pricing categories and you will fit into one of these three categories based on your income and household size. All right. The three categories have different labels attached to them. 50% MFI, 60% MFI and 80% MFI. The percentage has, is not a percentage of your income. Okay. Just to be clear. And I just want to remind people of that. Oops. Let me get rid of that screen. And there, and that might pop up again. I apologize for that. Okay. Um, so we have those three pricing categories. All right. Um, and I'm going to show you a chart where hopefully it'll make it more clear to you, but basically that MFI term 
that refers to median family income. Okay, and that's a number that's provided to the District of Columbia from, um, from HUD, um, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. And they do this every year. They provide this number every year. And it's a number that's used as a median income for households ranging from D.C. all the way up to Baltimore. Okay, it's, that, um, it's a statistical area that they use. But um, the number for right now, for this time frame we're in, is 142300 so that's 100 percent of the mfi and that's for a family of four and then um, they use that and do some math and they uh, break it down into three categories and they also break it down by household size okay um now before we jump right into the numbers who's going to verify your income when you're actually uh, you know trying to fill out the paperwork to move in um well, it's going to be a member of our staff at Housing Counseling Services. Uh, we certify the incomes for all renters and buyers in the IZ program. Um, a little over a year ago, um, rental um, incomes were certified by the landlord, um, but that process has shifted over to, um, to us at Housing Counseling Services, and so it's done uniformly now. Um, you know, some landlords might do things slightly different, but now it's all done uniformly. Okay. Um, what type of income are we talking about? Well, again, we're talking about your pre-tax or gross income for all members of the household. Okay. And like I said, it's the net proceeds for self-employment. So if someone's driving Uber, Lyft, something like that, then it would be the net income that they receive. Um, and so it would include, you know, of course, your employment, but it would also include things like unemployment. If, if you're drawing on that, maybe you're getting disability, uh, retirement, alimony, child support, SSI, TANF. If you're getting any of those, then it would include that. Okay, and that's considered income. Also, a factor in some of your assets, and it's a very, 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 very minuscule percentage of assets. I don't want, want people to be alarmed. Um, and we're talking, of course, about if someone has CDs and um, stocks and all that stuff. You know, then it gets into some different, um, some some different understandings. But you know, we do need all of that information. Okay. And um, right now, as you see on the screen, um, at a minimum, you need to provide this list of documents, um, tax returns, pay stubs, and such. Um, there's actually going to be a full one-page um, list that a person would be provided uh, when they are submitting documentation for an IZ home. Um, and so it, the list is longer than what you see here on the screen. Uh, and it also is going to include um, those, those apps and things that we all like to use these days. Cash App, Venmo, PayPal, all of that. You know, we need proof from all of those things, okay? And that's for everybody in the household. So, you know, we have to alert people to that. Um, now we're gonna jump right into some numbers for you to give you an idea of where you fit, which category you would be in. First of all, we've got a chart on the screen and it shows us a household size on the column to the furthest left, ranging from one to five. And then we've got three other columns um, first one is labeled 50% MFI, the second one is 60%, and the third one is 80%. And so these are the maximum household incomes based on household size. So um, for a family size of one, if it's a one-person household, if they earn less than $49,800, then they would be in the 50% MFI category, okay? Now let's say that one person household earns more than 49,800, but less than 59,750, then they would be in the 60% MFI category. But let's say that one person household earns more than 59,750, but less than 79,700, then they would be eligible for housing that's in the 80% MFI category. And if that one person household earns more than 79,700, then unfortunately they would not be eligible for the IZ program. And that's even if you're over um, by a dollar, okay? So it, it is followed that closely. 
Um, so I would encourage everybody to take a moment, find their household size here on the left, and then slide your finger towards the right until you come to a number where you find that your income would fall, okay? And these numbers are um, put out every year, typically in July. And so if you wind up renting or purchasing an IT unit after July of this year, the numbers may be slightly different. And, uh, and you would be told what the new numbers are at that point, okay? All righty. Yeah, the number of people includes all adults and children who live in the unit, as well as unborn children, if you have medical verification. You don't have to be related though, all right? So it doesn't have to be the, um, you know, the typical vision of what a family might be. It could be a couple of friends living together and it can be a household, okay? Um, people, you know, it can just be some, maybe some folks who live together in college and decide, that they want to rent together after they've graduated, well, they can do that, okay? They can be a household. Um, also, it doesn't have to be your current living situation. So let's say maybe right now, you, you know, you've got your own income, but you're living with a group of five others, maybe five other family members or something like that. And, you know, maybe you're kind of tired of, you know, having to share the bathroom or having your food stolen out of the fridge or whatever. Uh, well, you can strike out on your own. Um, you can be a household size of one. You just factor in your income. Okay? Okay. Now, another thing that's important to understand is your household size also determines what units you're eligible for. Um, because you're not allowed to have more than um, one bedroom per person. Or how should I say that? No, I should reverse that. I'm sorry. It should be a minimum of one person per bedroom. How's that? A minimum of one person per bedroom. So we have another chart here showing the number of people ranging from one to eight. And then we have various unit sizes next to it. So if you have a one person household, sticking with that, then they would be eligible for a studio, a one bedroom, or a one in den. And that's it, okay? Um, and then if you have a two-person household, they're eligible for the studio, the one bedroom, the one in den, the two bedroom, and two in den. And that's it, okay? So you see, you have to have at least one person per bedroom. So that one person household is not eligible for a two bedroom unit. And they do that to try to maximize the living space to accommodate as many people as possible. Because while you know, builders have built a good number of single or one bedroom units and two bedroom units, okay, uh, when the three and four bedroom units come up, you know, there are three person households, four person households who need that space. And if a one person household is sitting in a two, three, four bedroom home, you've got some people who need that space, okay? And so that's why it's set up that way. So now we're going to pause. We're gonna have our first poll question. So please remember your participation is required. All right, thank you, Ron. And here's our first poll question. You can download this presentation on our website. What's our website? Is the correct answer A, iz.com, B, hud.gov, C, housingetc.org, or D, housesareus.com? All right, I'm going to give everybody a minute to respond, and we'll go over the results. Ten more seconds on this question. All 
All right, I'm gonna go ahead and end this poll and let's review. You can download this presentation on our website. What's our website? And I'm pleased to see the majority of you got this correct. The answer is C, housingetc.org. So great job on this poll question, everybody. Once again, the correct answer was C. All right, back to you, Ron. to those of you who plan on renting through the inclusionary zoning program. And for renters, everyone needs to be aware that there is a minimum income requirement unless you are receiving a housing voucher or a rental subsidy, okay? And this minimum income was established to try to make sure that folks were um, successful renting through this program. Another requirement is that you're not allowed to spend more than 50% of your gross household income on your housing costs. The housing costs that are considered are your rent, utilities, and mandatory fees. Okay. If that occurs, that will be um, calculated when your income is certified, and our staff will notify you if you um, go above that 50% level. Um, now, keep in mind, if you do not meet the minimum income requirements, we do encourage you to continue to participate. Excuse me, I sneezed and now I got sniffles. Ah, ah, um, we do encourage you to continue to participate because there's always a chance that your income can go up. And the longer you're registered, the more beneficial it is to you when um, you go through this lottery process, okay? And so, um, if you go ahead and register now, even if your income doesn't meet the um, minimum income level, um, you'll be registered longer. And when your income finally does go above that minimum level, um, you'll have more time invested into the program, okay? Um, and then also, there is another program we're gonna talk about later on that I would encourage you to, uh, to stick around for that you could potentially still qualify for, all right? So, um, generally what we're talking about is the, the bare minimum that a person needs um, in order to qualify or be eligible is $26,650. That's to move into a studio, that smallest unit at the 50% MFI level, okay? So that's the bare minimum. But the minimums do change depending on um, the household size, or I should say the unit size, okay? Um, it also changes depending on which of the three categories you're in. And so just be aware of that and, um, and make sure that you're okay there. All right. Now, there's also maximum rents. Okay. As we said, this housing is supposed to be affordable. So they try to keep, um, you know, keep the rents below a certain amount. And um, these rents that you're seeing now on the screen include um, all utilities, okay? They include all utilities. So what we do have on the screen is another chart, and you'll see here we have various unit sizes on the far left, and then um, we have the three categories, 50, 60, and 80% MFI, and then on the far right, we have a sample utility estimate for each unit size, okay? And so the way this works is when the unit is built and it's designated into one of these three categories, 50, 60, or 80% MFI, and then, they, and then the, um, the city through the DC Department of Housing and Community Development will look at the unit size and they'll say, okay, this was designated at 50% back when the unit was built. It's a studio, so the maximum rent that you can charge is 110 one one thousand excuse me one thousand one hundred and ten dollars um and then they will check to see if that would include all utilities or not if it does include all you if the building does include all utilities that's it that stops there but if the building does not include all utilities in the rent then the city would go to this sample utility estimate and subtract a number somewhere between this range here somewhere in this range depending on which utilities that is that are not included, okay? And they will subtract some, some, something in that range from the maximum rent. 
and the landlord will be told that they must rent at that lower a rent amount. Okay. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, was, oh, the other thing I want to mention is that it does not include the optional fees. You know, these can be some of the fancy new buildings that have all the nice swimming pools, golf park on the roof, exercise room, you know, all that fun stuff. Well, if you're paying extra for those things, you know, that's something you choose to do based on your own ideas of your budget, okay? But that's not going to be factored into your rent. All right? Okay. Um, let's see. Anything else here? We'll leave it there for now. So, once again, it must be your principal residence, okay? You're not going to be allowed to sublease your unit, not going to be allowed to rent out any portion of your unit, not allowed to do Airbnb or any of those other programs. Your household also still may not spend more than 50% of your gross monthly income on your housing costs. Um, now, we in the counseling world encourage you to try to live at a level that's lower than that. Okay, so we encourage you to try to get down to 38% if you can, because you've got some other things to pay for, right? Other than your housing expenses, you know, groceries, transportation, you know, maybe daycare, depending on your circumstances. You know, so we encourage you to try to get your housing costs even at a smaller percentage of your uh, monthly budget, okay? Um, now, these are privately owned buildings. These are not government buildings. And so those private landlords out there, the Bazudos, EYAs, all those organizations, well, they have their criteria that they set up in order to um, move into their units. Those same criteria apply to you as an IC tenant. So you still must meet their requirements. And so, you know, if someone who's not in the IZ program lives in that building and they have to have a credit check, uh, background check on these things, you have to do the same thing, okay? And so you need to be prepared for that, all right? Your credit is still going to matter. Now, many properties require application fees, as you know, and that's all on you. You've got to pay the application fees. Now, assuming you go through the process of, of applying, having your credit check and everything, and you meet all the requirements of the IZ program, then you will sign the lease with the landlord. You will also sign a lease rider with the DC Department of Housing and Community Development. Okay, so you'll sign both. It will be a 12 month lease. You'll, your rent will be set at that same amount for the entire 12 months. It will not go up, will not go down. And then, if you want to stay in that unit beyond your 12 month lease, then no later than 60 days before that lease anniversary period, then you need to start the paperwork in order to recertify your income, okay? So that means submitting all of your pay stubs and tax returns and all that stuff to recertify your income. And you wanna do that for everybody living in the household. And um, let's see. Also, information on whatever the management company needs to, to verify what they need to keep you in that unit. And assuming all of that um, is okay, then you would sign a declaration of eligibility, okay? And in fact, everybody in the household who's going to be 18 or older needs to sign a declaration of eligibility form. Now, one thing that will happen, though, is your rent could potentially change, but it would be based on the IZ price schedule that's in place at the time of your renewal, okay? So let's say you're somebody who's here today to get a certificate because you feel like you need it to renew um, and you've got a rent right now. Then let's say you actually don't finish this process for whatever reason until after July. Well, in July, there will be a new IC price schedule in place. So your rent will be based on whatever that new price schedule says, okay? Now, one thing that's important to understand is for folks who are re renewing in the IZ program, you're going to be um, allowed some additional room or a buffer, if you will, in terms of your maximum income. 
um, you're going to be given a higher level that you can go up to. Um, what they've done over the years is they've increased the maximum rent allow, excuse me, the maximum income, not the rent, the maximum income allowed for renewing tenants. You can actually go up to 140% of the original, ma of this maximum, okay? And so what I would encourage you to do is maybe um, after we're done, you download the slide presentation, and you go back to that maximum income table, okay? And you can multiply the numbers in there by 1.4. That will give you the new maximum income for a renewing IZ tenant, okay? So for, for people who are renewing, you multiply that maximum by 1.4. All right. Now we're gonna pause and have Sean introduce us to another poll question. All right, thank you, Ron. And here is our next poll question. True or false, renters must meet a minimum income in order to be eligible for an IC unit. Again, true or false, renters must meet a minimum income in order to be eligible for an IC unit. All right, I'm gonna give everybody a minute to respond and we'll go over the results. Ten more seconds on this question. All right, I'm going to go ahead and end this poll and let's review. True or false, renters must meet a minimum income in order to be eligible for an IZ unit. And the correct answer here, and the majority of you got it correct, is true. So yes, keep in mind that renters will need to meet a minimum income in order to be eligible for an IZ unit. All right, back to you, Ron. Thank you. Now we're going to point out some important details for those of you who purchase IZ units. And so we begin by looking at the maximum purchase price schedule. This gives you an idea of how much the homes are going to cost. And um, what you'll see here is that the cheapest studio is at $128,000 and at 50% they met by category. And these are typical numbers, okay? They won't be exact. Um, but let's say it's a studio that um, someone already lives in and they're going to sell. They're moving out of the area. Well, they will be allowed to make a little bit of money on that unit. And so it might be 130000 or something like that. So these are typical maximum incomes, okay? Typical maximums. And um, that reminds me, for the renters, um, the maximum, um, or the minimum, excuse me, the minimum, in, the minimum, yeah, the minimum income, um, it were, those were typical minimum incomes for the rentals, okay? Um, basically, it can be slightly different from one building to the next. Okay, so just keeping that in mind. Um, and the, and the, then you have the um, typical maximum purchase prices here. Um, some other things that jump out at you as you look at this chart. Over here on the right, you'll see under a single family, there are no numbers here. Um, why is that? Well, that's because we're talking about studios and one bedrooms. And developers um, are not building single family homes as a studio or a single family home as a one bedroom. Okay, so there are, there are no units here to consider. Um, and then another thing that I will point out is for those of you who are one person households, remember what units you were eligible for? Studio, one bedroom and one in den. Well, with that said, you will be limited to only purchasing condominiums, okay? only condominiums for one person households. There are no single or studio, one bedroom, single family homes, okay? So just keep that in mind. If your goal is a one person household, if your goal is to purchase a townhouse, row house, something like that, you're not gonna do it with this program, okay? 
Now, and then another thing that I will mention, just so you know, for those of you who have larger household sizes, if you're looking for four bedrooms in particular, the builders just don't build that many of them. So your wait might be a little longer, okay? So if you need a four bedroom, uh, just be mindful that you might be waiting a little while, okay? Now, again, the unit must be your primary residence. Um, and for people who purchase, you certify that it is your primary residence every year. And that's all you certify, okay? Now, you're not going to be allowed to rent out any portion of it. Okay, you know you own it. You know, I've heard that argument before. Um, the program still does not allow you to rent out any portion of that home. Um, you're not going to be allowed to use it as Airbnb or any of that. And they take it seriously, guys, just so you know. Um, I've seen where they have taken people to court over it. Um, so they do take it seriously. So please be mindful of that. Now, the only exception is if your employer, once again, if your employer temporarily assigns you to work outside the DC metro area, then you'd be allowed to rent out your home. Okay. Um, but the amount, the amount in rent that you charge again, will be capped. There will be a maximum that DATD will tell you, okay? And so just be aware of that. And as I said before, you can sell at any point that you want to. But when you sell, you have to notify DATD that you're ready to sell. They will then calculate your maximum resale price. As I said, it's based on a formula that's in the regulations. And you can get access to the regulations by going to DATD's website. And we'll give you that website address shortly. Um, but you can get access to that, that uh, information that's on their website. I have taken the time to look at that formula. And just so you know, um, they do allow you to factor in the cost of renovations and repairs, things like that. And so if you do a major renovation, it's going to cost you several thousand dollars. It may be worth your while to hold on to your contract, your receipts and what have you. Share that information with DHCD and they can factor those costs into your resale price, okay? And, then, yeah, and you can see it uh, if you were to dig out that formula and the regulations. Um, and, uh, and just be mindful that um, if you decide to sell, you know, that DHCD must be notified, all right? Sometimes we've had some instances where people try to just get a realtor and, and go about the process ignoring DHCD. Well, it comes up <laughs> even at, at latest settlement because they're required to check the district records and it will be there attached to the deed, uh, the title, all that stuff. It will be there that it is an inclusionary zoning unit and that DHCD is required to be notified. Okay, so don't forget that. Um, now, if you're purchasing a condominium, just know that you're going to be paying condo fees. Okay, also be aware with newer buildings in particular, your condo fees will likely go up rather quickly as the developer leaves okay and there's a little history behind that but it happens repeatedly and so just be mindful your condo fees will go up you need to be prepared for that okay all right so when purchasing there's no minimum income required it sounds counterintuitive doesn't it um i'm buying spending a bit more money and, and I don't have to verify my income or my minimum income. You do have to verify your income, but there's no minimum income set. Well, guess what? The reason why they don't bother setting a minimum is they're going to rely on your bank or credit union, okay, to evaluate your finances and determine if you have the money to afford to make that purchase, okay? So they're relying on your bank or your credit union to do that. Now, you're still, though, not going to be allowed to spend more than 50% of your gross monthly income on your housing costs. In the case of buying, okay, those costs can be slightly different because it includes a mortgage payment now. And that mortgage payment is made up of the principal or the money that you borrow, right? You've got to pay that back. And then the interest on that money, also your property taxes and your homeowner's insurance. Ah, that keeps popping up. I will have to do something about that. Mm. Okay. So, um, so that's one of your housing costs, that mortgage payment. 
Then you also have your condo or homeowner association fees, okay? And of course your utilities. And then something else is important to understand. For those of you who are planning on buying, okay? You're going to have to participate in another webinar, all right? But that's only for folks who plan on buying. That other webinar that you're, going, that you're going to be required to participate in is going to last for eight hours. That's our home buying webinar, okay? We usually get it all done in one day, okay? Knock it out in one day, uh, but it is required for people who purchase IZ housing. If you plan on renting, you don't have to worry about it, all right? Just for people who plan on purchasing. And um, what will happen is, um, First, of course, you finish today's webinar. Hopefully, you get your certificate. Um, then uh, you will register initially in the IZ program. And everybody who registers at the beginning is going to be registered as a renter. That's everybody across the board. Then those of you who want to purchase also, okay, you will have to do the eight-hour webinar. Before you can attend that eight-hour webinar, you need to get us a pre-qualification letter from a lender. So you need to communicate with a lender, obtain a pre-qualification letter, and provide us with a copy of that. Once we have a copy of that, we will register you for the next available eight-hour class. All right? And so after you do all of that and you get your certificate from the eight-hour class, you will then change your registration in the IV program to include the fact that you want to purchase. Okay? All right. Now, there's some other things that we want to share with you that are not really affiliated with the IZ program, but what we just think is good for people who uh, who plan on buying in DC, good for you to know about, okay? Um, first of all, there is a potential opportunity for you to not pay property taxes for up to five years. That's part of the lower income homeownership tax abatement program. Okay. It's administered by the DC recorder of deeds. And actually what you do is you fill out a form and you can actually fill this form out at settlement. You fill out that form. If you're eligible, it's based on your household of the purchase price and all that stuff. Um, and most IZ housing would qualify. Um, but then you submit that at settlement and starting the October 1st, after your settlement, from that period on for the next possibly five years, you can go without paying property taxes. Okay. It does fade away as your income goes up. All right. So there's a potential for you to go up to five years without paying property taxes there. And it's not added on to the back end or anything like that. It's just totally wiped out for that time period. And then there's something else that's good to know is that um, for folks who have what's called resale restrictions on their property and IZ units do, right? Um, basically, you have the possibility of having a lower assessment rate. And that's going to be determined whenever they come out to do a, they call an assessment and to see what your home is worth for tax purposes. They will use a reduced rate to assess resale restricted properties. So you could be living in a condo, then someone right next to you or above you, whatever, is paying full price. You know, you're paying at a lower price. You bought, you're bought, you bought at a lower price, they're bought at a higher price. Well, you're going to pay less in taxes. Okay. Now, this usually is something that a person would have, um, would have done and to see if the home meets their criteria. This automatically occurs for IZ homes. Okay. It's actually been written into the IZ regulation. So that should happen automatically for you. And then some other programs that you might want to take advantage of are the Home Purchase Assistance Program, also known as HPAP. This provides money for down payment and closing costs in the form of an interest-free loan. Okay, so you're paying no interest on this money. You pay back what you borrow. And you have the possibility of receiving up to $206,000 in total. Okay. So it provides up to that amount. So it's a, it's a very popular program as a result, so much money involved. What that means is there is a backlog, just being frank with you, okay? So if you're interested, I encourage you to apply as soon as you can. It's gonna take several months for you to get approved, but at least you start the process as early as possible, 
okay? Now, to get started, you would have to participate in our pre-purchase orientation, okay? So that's a separate webinar altogether. Again, if you're making a note, it's our pre-purchase orientation. We call it the PPO. And you can actually sign up for this one on our website. All right, so you don't have to rush out and get a pre-qualification letter or anything like that. You can sign up for the pre-purchase one on our website. And so um, you might want to hurry up after, after we're done to sign up for that. Um, and then something else that's out there is something called DC Open Doors. And this is through the DC Housing Finance Agency, and it makes money available to help you purchase your home as well as provide money for down payment. Okay, and um, what this one does is it does charge an interest rate, but um, the housing finance agency markets it as having favorable interest rates. All right, and at this point in time, when interest rates have been going up and whatnot, um, this program has gotten very popular, and it also is a bit backlogged. Okay, and so if you're interested in having this money to help you purchase your home, then we encourage you to get to that website, dchfa.org, dchfa.org, it's there on the, on, on the screen right now. Go to that website, look for the program name, DC Open Doors, okay? Um, you'll find that information, there'll be a list of banks and credit unions eventually, you'll see that, and you actually fill out the application for this, for this money at one of those banks or credit unions, okay? All right. So now we're going to pause again and do another poll. All right. Thank you, Ron. And here is our next poll question. To be eligible to purchase an IZ unit, you must be invited to an eight-hour class. How do you receive an invite? Is the correct answer A, complete this orientation to receive your orientation certificate, B, email a pre-qualification letter from a lender to training at housingetc.org, or C, all of the above? All right, I'll give everybody a minute to respond and we'll go over the results. Ten more seconds on this question. All right, I'm going to go ahead and end this poll and let's review. To be eligible to purchase an IZ unit, you must be invited to an eight hour class. How do you receive an invite? And the correct answer here, and the majority of you got it correct, is C, all of the above. So yes, you must complete this orientation to receive your certificate, and then you must also email a pre-qualification letter from a lender to training at housingetc.org. So great job on this poll question, everyone. Once again, the correct answer was C. All right, back to you, Ron. Great, thank you. All right, so now we're gonna talk a bit about um, this IZ random selection or lottery process. And so basically how things kick off is when a building or a unit is ready, um, then the, the builder or the landlord or what have you will notify DHCD. And then DHCD will collect information about the unit and then notify folks who they think are eligible for that unit. So they'll look on the house, they'll look at the household size and all that stuff, the income, and they'll notify the folks who they think would be eligible for that particular unit. And they'll let them know, there's gonna be this lottery, this is the information we have on the unit. Do you wanna be in this lottery? And then you'll have to you know, click on a link. You see, it's gonna to come to you by email. And so there'll be a link in that email that you have to click on to let them know that you're interested if you, if you are. All right. If you're not interested, that's okay. You can pass on it and it does not count against you. You can pass as many times as you want to. Okay. It will never count against you. Um, and so then you let them know that you're interested and you want to respond as quickly as you can because DHD has a time limit as to how long they can wait before they have to hold the lottery. All right. 
um, in the regulations. You know, they're told they have to pull the lottery within 17 days. And um, so they're not going to wait forever. Okay. Um, so you let them know you're interested. And after they get their responses before that 17 days, then they will go ahead and hold the random selection. And um, they will select at a minimum four households for each unit. Okay. Minimum of four. But they can select pretty much as many as they want. Okay, I've seen lists of 10, 20, 30, more, okay? And so, um, you know, the names will be picked and then they will notify those people again by email that their names were picked in the lottery, all right? Now, keep in mind, they're not quote unquote the winner, okay, because this was a group of folks whose names were selected. So they, they'll notify that group. Um, now, some questions that sometimes arise is how does, what person get picked. Basically, it's a random process, okay? Um, what you're signing on to is a registration list, not a waiting list, okay? And so what that means is there's no time in terms of how long it's gonna take for you to get registered. I mean, not registered, for you to get picked, okay? There's no estimate that anybody can give you. Um, it's a totally random process and each lottery is different because they never know how many people are interested. You know, it could be, um, you know, a holiday weekend or a holiday week or whatever you want to call it. And, you know, everybody's too busy to check their email. And so very few people respond. Or it could be a particular building that everybody's excited about and wants to move into. And so everybody responds, okay? Um, so it really is different for each unit. There's no odds they can give you. So there's really no time estimate anybody can give you. And I've been told by people anecdotally that, um, you know, one person in actuality, because it was a new building opening up and they opened up all their IT units at the same time. And so this one person got picked for three different units in the same building, okay, in the first week of their registration. All right. But then, of course, and conversely, I uh, sometimes talk to people who have been waiting for months and months and months and had never been picked for anything okay so there's just really no estimate that anybody can give you and what i like to say here is, is you know, just to make sure people understand this is not a program that's designed to deal with housing emergencies okay um we know by virtue of the work we do that you know there are people who have for various reasons wind up in an urgent need for housing. The IZ program is not designed to accommodate that urgency. It, it's got timelines that it needs to go through, process that it needs to go through, the way it was set up through regulation, okay? And so if you're in an urgent housing situation right now where you desperately need housing right away, then I strongly encourage you to check your other housing search resources, okay? Do not rely on this program alone. All right. Okay. Now, when households are selected, okay, and they've got this group of folks, you know, maybe they pick, you know, 20 names, right? Um, then they will be placed in a priority order. All right. It'll start by looking at the kind of names that float to the top of the list are names where someone in, on, in that household either lives or works in DC. Okay, so those names float to the top of the list. And then they will place folks in order based on how long they've been registered. And so the household that's registered the longest where someone has either lived or worked in DC, well, that household will be placed in at the top of the list, number one, all right? And then we'll go down from there. And then they'll be done with those folks who have someone who lives or works in DC. Then they'll be looking at the folks where no one in the household lives in DC, no one in the household works in DC. And then those folks will also be placed in a ranking order by how long they've been registered in the program, okay? And you know, with the 20 names, you would think that they would never get to someone who doesn't live or work in DC. Believe it or not, sometimes they do because for various reasons, they might work their way down that list and um, have to tap into that grouping of people, all right? And I've seen it happen more than once. 
um, you know, number one gets knocked out because maybe their credit was bad. Number two has already found housing somewhere else, couldn't wait. Number three doesn't like the location, so they, they pass on it. Number four, you know, so you see it happens frequently like this. So they work their way down that list pretty fast sometimes. And um, so all of that to say, if you're lower on the list, don't let that discourage you, okay? If you're lower on the list, but if you know you're ready financially to move forward, then by all means, still do your do what you're told and and when you're notified about it, you know, take the steps necessary when you're notified about it to put yourself in the running. Okay, get your documentation submitted and all of that. All right. Okay. Um, let's see. That's it for that. Now. Something else that you need to be aware of is the email you receive is meant for your household only. Um, the way it works is when they do the drawing, someone out of that list of names, that, that list of households, one of those have to be one of the people who moves into that unit. And so there's no good, uh, it does no good to forward your email to somebody else. Their name wasn't drawn in the lottery, okay? And you will continue to receive email notifications about lotteries um, as long as you, you know, keep your registration current. Okay, uh, and so that means that um, you have you don't tell DHCD to remove you from the registration list, or you don't, um, or you make sure that you renew your orientation. <coughs> Excuse me, you renew your orientation certificate before the two years is up because this certificate you're going to get uh, from this webinar is going to be good for two years. All right. And so you want to make sure you're renewed before that two years is up. Now, one thing that you need to be aware of is if you purchase or actually lease an IC unit, your name automatically comes out of the registration pool. Okay. And um, so if that happens, um, sometimes I'm, I'm asked, well, you know, let's say I'm renting and uh, I want to later purchase an IC unit. Well, you can stay on the list if you have to do something. Remember, you get that pre-qualification letter from a lender and you do the eight hour home buying course. Okay. And then you can change your registration to being a home buyer. All right. Now, another thing that sometimes ties into that for some people is they desire to purchase the unit they're currently renting. Well, I need to make sure you understand something. It's a rental building, an apartment building, and the individual units are not for sale. The IZ units are not for sale. And so if you want to become an owner, it's going to have to be a separate unit altogether. So you're going to have to move out of your apartment and purchase something else. Um, and this is so this is not a rent to own program. All right. And in fact, DC has no rent to own programs right now. All right. All right. Um, let's see. So this is why I need to mention that this is an email driven program. If you haven't picked up on that. Okay. It's all been done by email, uh, as I've explained it so far. Right. So it's totally email driven. You need to check your email on a regular basis and, and also check your spam and junk mail folder. Okay. Um, and you need to, as I said, you need to check it on a regular basis and you need to open the emails. <laughs> this harps on a point that uh, I drive home because of a person who called me one time was frustrated. They had been in the program for uh, over a year. Um, they had not been able to rent anything. And uh, we discussed it. it. Turns out they were indeed getting emails from DHCD, but they didn't open a single one. They never opened the emails they were receiving. So they didn't take the steps they needed to, to put themselves into the running for a unit. You see, it is an opt in program. So you have to actively click a link and let them know that yes, you want to be in that lottery. All right. So please open the emails. And when you open those emails, read them carefully, read all the information. All right. Um, make sure that if there are any deadlines, you respond before those deadlines. Now, if you're not interested, remember, you don't have to respond. If you're not interested, you can pass. And as I said before, you can pass as many times as you want. 
okay? It does not count against you. So you want to enter only if you're actually interested and you need to think about something else. Make sure that you feel pretty strongly that you're going to qualify financially also, okay? That you're ready to take on that rent or that purchase price. And then when you get those emails, as I said, you want to click on that link, okay? And it's going to be a short form link. You want to click on that and let them know that you're interested. And if you're having trouble clicking a link on one device, then try it on a separate device, a different device, and see if the link will work there, okay? And only one entry is allowed per household. Now, let's say you respond to the email, and let's say you're selected. Great, you know, you're one of that 10 or 20 names that were selected. At that point, you will receive a letter again by email, all right? So you again, you wanna read it. Um, now, sometimes, People submit that first email to see to say if they're interested and they don't hear anything back. Well, unfortunately, that means you were not selected. Okay? Uh, so just be aware of that. But if you are selected, you'll be notified by email. Now, at that point, you might have a chance to rent or purchase. Okay? Um, and you need to respond and let them know that you're, uh, that you're still interested. You need to do it again. Okay? They have a confirmation of interest form that you need to fill out. Okay, and then um, and there's a deadline for that. We're gonna go over deadlines in a moment. Um, as I said, if you're not interested, interested, you can pass. Um, now, again, if you're not the highest ranked household, but if you know you're ready to move forward financially, still go for it. Okay, and don't wait till the last minute. Don't wait till the last day of a deadline. All right. In this day and age, when everything's done electronically. You never know when something's going to happen and you're going to lose power or what have you. You don't want to be sitting there on the 10th day of a deadline um, and for maybe a storm comes through and your power's out. You know, if you would just submit it on day nine instead, right? <laughs> so keep that in mind. So these are the deadlines we're talking about. Day one starts it off where that's when you're notified that you're selected. Then day 10 is a deadline to submit your confirmation of interest form, okay? And it's a hard deadline. Day 11 is too late. Day 30, that's a deadline to submit your required documents. So we're talking about those pay stubs and tax returns and bank statements, all that fun stuff, right? And then day 60 is the deadline when hopefully you'll have a signed contract or a signed lease for that new unit. And we have to go through this time period, so again, if you're in an urgent situation, you need to be in housing, you know, within the next five days or something like that, this program's not going to accommodate that. Okay. So we're going to pause here and have another poll question. All right. Thank you, Ron. And here's our next poll question. In order to register for the rental program, I need to, is the correct answer A, do nothing, someone will reach out to me. B, call housing counseling services, or C, register my certificate at dhcd.dc.gov. All right, I'll give everybody a minute to respond and we'll go over the results. Ten more seconds on this question. All right, I'm going to go ahead and end this poll and let's review. In order to register for the rental program, I need to and the correct answer here, and yes, the majority of you got it correct, is C. You must register your certificate at dhcd.dc.gov. So great job on this poll question, everyone. Once again, the correct answer was C. All right, back to you, Ron. Okay, thank you. But now we're going to go over some next steps. So uh, basically, just to reiterate, the website again is dhcd.dc.gov. 
all right? When you arrive there, okay, you'll initially run into a pop-up box. And this is, uh, I think it appears on just about every DC government website now. It's gonna ask you for your email address. And they're just trying to stay in contact with the citizens here. Um, but you wanna get past that pop-up box, okay? Um, and then you wanna click on the services tab, okay? Um, and then there'll be a drop-down menu. From that drop-down menu, you want to select IZ registration. And that'll take you to the registration form. There's gonna be a few pages okay that you'll fill out so it's more than just your email address so if you fill out something where you think yeah, yeah, you done just on your email address and it says okay we're done that's not it okay be mindful of that now remember only one registration is permitted per household and for those of you who are renewing they still want you to go to the website and fill out the form all right um, they will that they'll use that to update your information. You know, maybe you it's at the end of your two years. Maybe your information has changed in that time. So they'll use that as a way to update your information. You will keep your original registration date. All right. So um, please do register as well. Now, uh, while you're waiting for your emails from the IZ program, continue to use your other housing search resources. All right. Um, as a reminder, we mentioned the DC Housing Finance Agency. Not only do they have DC Open Doors as one program, but they have a few other things that could be beneficial to um, buyers and renters in DC. So we encourage you to explore their website. And then there's HUD.gov, and HUD has tons of resources uh, for rental or purchase across the United States. So that's definitely a website you want to explore. And then there's another one, which is dchousingsearch.org. Now, this one is good for those of you in particular who are participating in the IZ program because every single IZ unit that is available is required to be posted to this website. Okay? Again, that's dchousingsearch.org. And so this is what that website looks like, dchousingsearch.org. When you arrive there, um, you will see that you have the ability to search just for inclusionary zoning units. And you click that yes box. The reason why is because in actuality, anybody can post any property on this website. Any property in DC can be posted to this website. And so, yes, you wanna take the time to explore uh, other properties as well, but you can do a search strictly for inclusionary zoning units. As I said, all IC units are required to be posted here. The city requires that. Even the lottery properties will be posted here to this website. You need to understand something though. Even though you find a lottery property on this website, that does not mean that anybody and everybody can apply towards that property. Only those people who were notified directly by DHCD about the lottery for that unit, okay? Those are the folks who have a chance at it. So they put them all there for informational purposes, but if you're not in the lottery for that unit, you're not gonna be allowed to apply for it, all right? But they're there for informational purposes. Let's say you are selected in a lottery, right? You can go to this website and pick up on some more information about the property that might not have been in that email that you got. You might even see some pictures here on the website, okay? So that's for folks who are selected in a lottery. Um, now, there is a way to get access to some properties that are not in a lottery, all right? IZ properties that are not in a lottery. And, um, I'm going to go into detail on that in just a moment, okay? One thing I do want to touch on, because we're seeing it here for the first time, is ADUs. ADUs, or well, that acronym stands for Affordable Dwelling Units. Affordable Dwelling Units. And these um, are similar to inclusionary zoning units. And I'm going to I have a separate slide on affordable dwelling units. We're going to talk about those briefly, okay? Yeah. 
Ah, that's why we can click. Let's get this out of the way. I have got to take care of that. All right. So now, you see only DHD can hold the initial random lotteries, right, for IZ units. Um, but sometimes units go through one lottery, maybe even two lotteries, without finding a renter or if it's for sale, not finding a buyer, okay? If that happens, then the landlord or the seller can ask DHCD for permission to market the unit uh, themselves, okay? And so, and if the market themselves means that it's, um, it's, it's available for any IZ participant to potentially apply to as long as they meet the income and household size requirements, okay? You see, you still need to meet those requirements. You still need to have a certificate from an orientation like this. You still need to be registered in the IZ program, okay? With all of that, you could potentially still find some properties outside the lottery system. Now, it's not going to be a whole lot. You know, as hard as it is to find affordable housing, think about the fact that it would have gone through one lottery, possibly two lotteries, and no one has gotten it. Okay, so it's just not going to be a whole lot of those properties out there, but they, they we might stumble across one. Okay, um, let's see. So you have that possibility, and um, so if you find one on that website, then you notify or you contact the people who have it, be it a, a landlord or a salesperson. And you let them know that you're interested and they'll give you the instructions to move forward. Okay. Now DHCD has something else, another resource, they call it a property dashboard. And it's an IZ ADU property dashboard. That dashboard, unfortunately, is not the most effective tool. Okay. And so just be aware it's not really that effective because it doesn't just list properties that are actively available. It lists every single property that has ever been in the IZ program and every single property that has ever been in the affordable dwelling unit program. And it just listed as raw data. Okay. You're not going to be allowed to um, see if it's available right now. You're not going to be allowed to see if it's for sale or for rent, you know, those kinds of things. Okay. So it's not that useful a tool is what it boils down to. All right, but that's the IZ ABU property dashboard. All right, so when you're doing your search on dchousingsearch.org and you come across an IZ unit, read the detailed description. All right, read that detailed description. Let's see here, you have you must receive an email invitation from DHCD to participate in the lottery for this property. Okay. So that's a lottery property. If your name wasn't drawn, you cannot go for that one. Okay. But let's say you read a detailed description and it says, contact the sales or leasing agent listed in this ad. Well, then that's a non lottery property and you might have a shot. All right. And so you do want to follow that instruction and reach out to that sales or leasing office. Okay. All right. So portable dwelling units, ADUs. This program is of interest because it has properties for rent as well as some properties for sale. Uh, the ADU program has been around longer than the IZ program. You know, it's an older program. And it has more units, all right? It's been around longer and has more units. Um, also, their properties are available at a lower median family income or even at a higher one. You see, they have a broader range. It could be anywhere between 30 and 120% MFI. So if you were below the minimum income for the IZ program, Okay, remember it was at 50% MFI. 
you might still be eligible for an affordable dwelling unit because it goes it could potentially go down to 30 percent mfi all right conversely if you made too much money for the iz program okay remember it topped out at 80 percent mfi well this one goes up to 120 percent mfi so there's some units that you could potentially still be um, able to purchase or rent, okay? Um, but that's at the maximum income. Now, each property has its own mix of guidelines, okay? And so you do wanna check with each individual property to see what the specific requirements are for that property. Now, another thing that some people like is the fact that you don't have to register for an affordable dwelling unit or for an affordable dwelling unit program. There's no registration. And so what that means is, you know, you can apply to any of these properties that you stumble across. Okay. But on the negative side, what that means is since your email is not on any registration anywhere, they're not going to be able to notify you about units. Okay. So you've got to find these on your own. Uh, maybe you can get the help of a real estate agent. They can help you find them also, but you've got to find them. And when you find them, then you can apply but the one resource that has all adus that are available is dchousingsearch.org okay this has the adus that are available all right all right so this gives you an idea of what the dashboard looks like the one i told you that wasn't all that effective okay it's raw data a bunch of numbers raw data You've got addresses of every single ADU ever built in the District of Columbia and every single IZ ever built in the District of Columbia. But it doesn't tell you if it's available right now. Okay, so it's not that useful. Okay. And so this basically explains all that I just went through, right? Okay. So in terms of getting to access to the program, you go to their website, dhcd.dc.gov. You go to the services tab. You go to inclusionary zoning registration. Okay, you fill that out. Now, if you want to see some other forms, you have that option as well. Okay, you also have the option of looking for their property dashboard. Okay, so it gives you all of those possibilities. Now, whether you're renting or purchasing, whether you're doing ADU or IZ, your credit is going to matter, all right? So you want it to be as strong as possible. Um, there are several community-based organizations here in the District of Columbia that uh, can work with you on making your credit strong. And, and my thought is that everybody, regardless where your credit is right now, it can always be improved, okay? And I, I mean everybody. And so, you know, you have... Um, the access to the Greater Washington Urban League, Latino Economic Development Center, Lydia's House, MANA, Marshall Heights Community Development Organization, University Legal Services, as well as the United Planning Organization. And it's free. Your tax dollars are already at work. You can take advantage of that, okay? And in terms of your credit, just be mindful that you need to look at your credit report. One out of every four credit reports has a mistake on it. We've got roughly 270 people on this webinar right now. That means roughly 67 of us right now have a mistake on our credit report. 67, that's not a small number. Take the time to look at your credit report, okay? Some other steps to get ready is you wanna focus on documentation. You wanna get all of that in order so that you know where it is, how to get access, that kind of thing. If you've just done your tax returns or preparing to do so, you want to be able to, you know, hold on to that information, know where it is, where you store it. Try to get it in an electronic format so that you can transfer that information easily. Um, some of us, you know, have access to pay stubs and bank statements and whatnot online. So you want to know which websites to go to, your passwords, all of that stuff. Okay. Get all that information together now so that you're not trying to find it desperately when a deadline is approaching, okay? Let's see. And then for those of you who are participating already in the HPAP program, uh, let's say you've been approved for that, you would have a, a notice of eligibility. 
then uh, we'll accept that instead of a pre-qualification letter to get you into that eight hour class. Okay. But if you are not uh, in the HPAP program and don't have that NOE, uh, you're going to need that pre-qualification letter. Okay. And get a copy of that to us and we can get you in that eight hour class. That's if you plan on buying. All right. Okay. Now there are a smaller number of organizations that offer the eight hour class. We are one of them. But then you also have the Latino Economic Development Corporation, Lydia's House, Mana Incorporated, and the University Legal Services. So don't forget when you get your certificate in five business days that you want to register it at DACD's website. If you want to purchase, you want to do the eight hour class. So you need to get that pre qualification letter to us. Once you register on DACD's website, start checking it regularly, start checking your email, I should say, regularly for those announcements about IC units, all right? When you come across one that you're interested in, go for it, okay? If you're not interested, you can pass, all right? Now, another thing to think about is your financial circumstances at that time. You wanna be able to know that you're gonna meet whatever financial requirements there are and credit requirements. Um, you also wanna continue using your other housing search sources because this is a random process. You never know when your name will be picked. Okay, always work on your credit. And don't forget the certificate you get from us is gonna be good for two years, all right? So you're gonna to need to renew it in two years time. And this is what um, the website looks like. Remember first though, you get to it by going to dacd.dc.gov. You click on the services tab and you go to IC registration. When you get there, you'll get some information to explain things. You click next, then you start filling out some paperwork. Well, not paperwork, but you know what I mean. <laughs> you start filling out these blocks here, right? So putting in your information, okay? And you put in, you answer some more questions, you put in some more information. So you see it's more than just your email, right? And you click submit, okay? So that's the way the process works. Again, it starts at dhcd.dc.gov. So I've completed my portion of today's webinar. I'm gonna turn things over to Sean. He's gonna wrap up, wrap things up with you, go over a little bit of information as well as the final quiz. All right, thank you, Ron. Um, and yes, as Ron said, I'm gonna be posting the final quiz in just a moment. Um, and then stick around afterwards, please. We have one more slide just to let you know what to expect next. Um, now regarding the final quiz, I'm gonna read each question twice and everybody will have a full five minutes to submit your answers and then we'll review. Um, now, if perhaps you are calling in on a telephone and you're not able to access the final quiz, we'll provide you an email address on the final slide and you can reach out to us and we'll send you an alternate version of the quiz to complete. All right, uh, but with that said, I'm gonna go ahead and launch our final quiz. All right, let's get started. Question one, true or false? As a household of one, I can qualify for a two bedroom unit through inclusionary zoning. Again, true or false. As a household of one, I can qualify for a two bedroom unit through inclusionary zoning. Question two, true or false. As the owner of an IZ unit, I am able to rent out or sublet my unit at my own discretion. Again, true or false. As the owner of an IZ unit, I am able to rent out or sublet my unit at my own discretion. Question three, if I fully participated today and I passed this quiz, then I should expect to receive my certificate in as the correct answer a month, five business days or an hour. Again, if I fully participated today and I passed this quiz, then I should expect to receive my certificate in as the correct answer a month, five business days or an hour. Question four, true or false? While the majority of, of IZ units are assigned to a household through the random selection process, it is possible to apply directly in some cases. Again, true or false? While the majority of IZ units are assigned to a household through the random selection process, it is possible to apply directly in some cases. Question five, true or false? Application fees and amenity fees for IZ renters and condo and HOA fees for IZ owners are regulated by DHCD. Again, true or false. Application fees and amenity fees for IZ renters and condo and HOA fees for IZ owners 
are regulated by DHCD. And lastly, question six, true or false? In order to keep my IZ registration active, I must reattend this orientation every two years. Again, true or false? In order to keep my IZ registration active, I must reattend this orientation every two years. All right, I'm gonna give everybody the full five minutes to submit your answers, and then we'll go over the results. Two more minutes on the final quiz, two more minutes. Also, I saw a request for me to repeat the second question, um, so I'll go ahead and do that. Um, it was true or false, as the owner of an IZ unit, I am able to rent out or sublet my unit at my own discretion. One more minute left on the final quiz. One more minute. Ten more seconds on the final quiz. All right, I'm going to go ahead and end our final quiz. We got great participation, so thank you. Um, so I'm going to end it and let's review our answers. All right, so question one, true or false? As a household of one, I can qualify for a two bedroom unit through inclusionary zoning. And the correct answer here, and the majority of you got it correct, is false. So remember, as a household size of one, you would be eligible for a studio or one bedroom. You would not be eligible for a two bedroom unit through inclusionary zoning. But great job on question one. Once again, the correct answer was false. Question two, true or false. As the owner of an IZ unit, I am able to rent out or sublet my unit at my own discretion. And the correct answer here, and once again, the majority of you got it correct, is false. Um, so even if you are the owner of an IZ unit, the guidelines of the program state that you cannot rent out or sublet that unit at your own discretion. But great job on question two. Once again, the correct answer was false. Question three, if I fully participated today and I passed this quiz, then I should expect to receive my certificate in and the correct answer here is yes, five business days. Uh, so just keep in mind um, that the weekends and holidays do not count as business days, uh, but we will be working very hard to get your certificates in a timely fashion. But great job on question three. Once again, the correct answer was five business days. Question four, true or false? While the majority of IZ units are assigned to a household through the random selection process, 
it is possible to apply directly in some cases. And the correct answer here, and the majority of you got it correct, is true. Um, so Ron mentioned a really good website, dchousingsearch.org, um, and on that site you can find IZ and ADUs um, that are possible to apply directly. But great job on question four. Once again, the correct answer was true. Question five, true or false? Application fees and amenity fees for IZ renters and condo and HOA fees for IZ owners are regulated by DHCD. And the correct answer here is yes, false. So the majority of you also got this correct. Um, so just keep in mind that DHCD does not regulate um, things like application fees, amenity fees, um, or condo or HOA fees. But once again, great job on question five. The correct answer was false. And lastly, question six, true or false. In order to keep my IZ registration active, I must reattend this orientation every two years. And yes, the majority of you got this correct. The answer is true. So you will want to reattend this orientation every two years in order to keep that IZ registration active. But across the board, great job, everybody, on our final quiz. So I'm going to stop sharing and let's go over our final slide of the day. All right, so here's what to expect next. Um, so firstly, if you're eligible, you will receive an email within five business days. Um, this email will include your certificate as well as instructions for moving forward. Hmm. Now, as you see in bullet point two, this particular email will be coming from a fairly wacky looking email address. Um, so we mention that because oftentimes we find that certificates can end up um, in individuals junk or spam mailboxes. So we do ask that you check all of your inboxes um, once we get to that fifth business day. Um, additionally, Please do not email us about your certificate, quiz score, or eligibility before five business days. Uh, we will be working very hard to review our reports, um, and we will update you within five business days. Um, additionally, if for any reason you happen to have missed more than 15 minutes of today's presentation, um, or perhaps you did not take the final quiz, we will send you an email from training at housingetc.org, and we'll let you know that. Um, and if that is the case, you would need to retake the webinar in order to get a certificate. Um, and also just a, um, another reminder, if you weren't able to answer that final quiz um, only in that situation, then you can reach out to us at training at housingetc.org and we'll email you an alternate version of the quiz to complete. All right. Um, now, I know we did cover quite a bit of information today, and you may want to review it on your own. So this presentation is actually available to download at our webinar registration page. So simply visit our website, housingetc.org, navigate to the webinar registration page, scroll to inclusionary zoning, and you'll be able to download the slides from today's workshop. Um, and then lastly, certificates will be made in the name under which you registered for this class. Uh, so we do mention that because we're not able to issue certificates to any other individual or name other than the one in which you registered. All right. Um, but now we have reached the end of today's presentation. Um, thank you, Ron, for a great presentation. And thank you all for joining us. We're going to stick around for an additional minute or two um, if you have any last minute questions. If so, please direct them to the Q&A box and we'll be sure to get back to you with an answer. Now, if you do not have any further questions today, you are free to leave as this webinar is now concluded. Um, I wish everyone the best of luck in your housing endeavors. And once again, thank you for joining us.